Ja, då har vi fått med oss David King som ska dirigera Eikanger Björsvik musiklag till Europamästerskapet för Brossband i Freiburg 2015. Det går av stabel första helgen i maj, första och andra maj. Det streames också på natten så du kan få det med dig även om du inte är er i Tyskland. Uh, David King, welcome back to Norway. Thank you. Always a pleasure to see you. Likewise, Stein. It's good to be home. Yeah, it feels like home, does it? It does, yeah. It's been a lot of years now. Mm. I think I was talking with Ray Gilead this morning about how many years working with uh, with brass bands here in Norway. I think with the um, the elite division, I think it goes back to 1989, so it's a fair few years. Certainly most of my adult life and, and uh, my professional work has always been linked fairly inseparably with Norway, so it does feel very much like like coming home, especially Bergen, if any city, of course, it's Bergen, because some, um, of course, our heritage, the Australians and the Norwegians goes back to the time of Percy Granger, who, of course, was our great folk song writer and arranger. And of course, he was extremely close as an Australian composer. Percy Granger was extremely close with, uh, with the Norwegian composer, of course, Edvard Grieg, and they became inseparable as companions in music, especially in the latter life the latter years of the life of um, Grieg. He was particularly fond of the, the um, interpretations and the performance skills of the Percy Granger. So it's kind of a, a haunting, happy experience having um, associations of many years as an Australian coming so far, but still feeling this sense that there's some tradition between these two nations culturally, in music particularly. And then particularly brass band. Mm. You are conducting the Eikanger Björsvik Musiklag for the EBBC 2015. Uh, are the preparations well on the way? They are. Of course, the band's put an enormous effort in with Ray Gilead, their music director, in the months leading up to, to this. In fact, it's been now, will you help me with this, um, Stain? How many months? Two months now since Enum? Yeah. So the band almost came out of out of one um, fiery furnace into another and they've worked extremely hard and I think this particular year I think they've had a, um, a little um, time problem in, in that this year I think the European Championships and the Easter holidays have kind of made preparation even more um, challenging I think you know in, in working experiences for people to try to get the time off work so I think a lot of um, the band have said this has probably been the most challenging period in terms of preparation that they've had for some years with the Easter holidays being so close to the European. But um, here I am in enjoying um, a time just after the Easter period with the sun shining here in Bergen and yet we're in the rehearsal room and not one sign of any doubt from anybody in the band. They're absolutely delighted to be so committed to this European festival, of course representing not just uh, their local area representing the whole of Norway. So I think that's a, a fairly um, positive and optimistic way to look at it because it's such a competitive arena that brass bands are involved in. And I think here in Norway, it's a hotbed of, um, of, um, of competition. But I think when a band goes to the European Championships, I think the whole nation of, of, um, of musicians and particularly the brass band musicians come together and feel that they're being represented. So hopefully that's uh, something that will bring some pride back into um, into the, the fold here in Norway. Yeah, and it's been quite close the last couple of years. Um, mm. Second place two times in a row. It's about time to break that circle, isn't it? I'll see <laughs> how we go. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a tricky one. Mm. Uh, it's a tricky one because you could play a performance as most people listening to this little broadcast well, no, you can play a performance which you think is quite memorable and it not quite be what um, someone else might like as their taste musically. I think a classic example of that is looking at Ikanga over the last um, four or five years. I think they've um, fairly um, taken, I think, four national titles in a row and a, a fantastic achievement by the players. And um, I think this last year, I think they got second. With this. Yeah, they got second. I know it wasn't first, so they got second this year. Now that's interesting because probably of all the performances over that period of five years, the most um, musically satisfying in terms of where they actually um, managed to um, 
to put their mark, I suppose, in terms of um, the credibility of reflecting the composer's intention, I, I thought was probably this year. There's a classic example of um, a test piece, um, you know, um, that took a lot of a lot of work to actually go back into of distant memories, and yet uh, they didn't win. So, and fair and square, no problem. But you can never really be sure just because your band is playing better than they did when they were winning, and vice versa. You could perhaps play a performance that you think could be better and end up taking the prize. So that's the art of contesting, taking the wins and the losers equally and just seeing it as an opportunity to express how they feel, how the band wants to convey the score, the canvas, how they paint the picture and leave it with the imagination of those that listen as to whether it's what they feel and empathy and a, um, a oneness for. So uh, no promises, no promises <laughs> staying for first prizes. They're pretty tough, these first prizes in, in any arena. But uh, certainly it's lovely to come to the band with just uh, two weeks. I have only had two weeks. It will be two weeks um, preparation for me, which is not very long. That's where the, the creative team who put an enormous um, contribution musically and technically into these bands right across the country, but particularly for Ikanga, um, Ray Gilead, who works and does all the, the exceptionally uh, difficult um, musical and technical preparation, without which I couldn't enjoy living in Australia for the time that I do and just swanning in, I suppose you should say, for two weeks' work. <laughs> Seems a bit unfair, really, but um, it's a privilege, that's for sure. Mm. Very dedicated group of uh, musicians in, in, in the Aikanga band. Um, you mentioned the set test piece is always uh, difficult. You don't have very much time to prepare for the set test piece. It, it's only reason, reason being released what is to be the set piece and, and, and this year it's the God Particle. Mm. Uh, is well, the, it e exciting yeah. to work on, on, on the set test piece? Yeah, I mean, every piece is exciting in its own way. I think um, the God Particle, or as it's been nicknamed, the God Damn It Particle, <laughs> the God Damn It Particle um, is a, a heck of a challenge uh, for conductors, for, for players, for ensemble, for soloists. Everything is sort of a very high level of expectation. I think there's two interesting things about the piece. I think the, the, the main thing actually is that it's the first piece, I think, in saying that a German composer mm. written for the, for the European Championships. I mean, that's quite amazing when you consider that the cradle of culture and everything that comes out from the time of Bach right through um, emanates from this cradle of culture. And yet the brass bands haven't had a, in the European competition arena, um, a major work from a German composer. I find that extremely exciting. We talk about new music, but to have new nations contributing, um, particularly with a backdrop of cultural identity, of course, that no one has like the Germans. Um, and I think that's going to be very, very um, compelling um, for the listeners to see what a German composer, who actually isn't a brass bander, of course, um, he's a composer, full stop, yeah. of, of great music. Uh, and I'm impressed looking at the score with not the complexity. Complexity doesn't impress, it challenges. Mm. But the thing that impresses most is the underlying musical lines within this um, mass fragment that's full of particles in itself. The score is itself a goddammit particle, <laughs> a mess of, uh, of notes. Yet in there is this wonderful conception and um, Germanic cell that's mm. permeating all the way through. And without going into the technicalities of the score, there's some wonderful um, notes, preface notes by the composer, and uh, he's obviously thought this through. In terms of the lay of the score, in other words, how the instrumentation works, the interesting um, aspect of this particular piece, Stain, is that the composer almost has written this as if he's writing with no inhibitions. Uh, he doesn't necessarily always write idiomatically. In other words, he doesn't write the music in a way which is approachable or easy for the, the players to, to grasp. He would write a line because he wants that musical line played, whether he thinks that's uh, the sound of a flute or the sound of a clarinet, whatever, only he, only he could answer that. But there's clarinet and flute parts in there that are fiendishly difficult on a three-valved cornet or um, tenor horns playing some beautiful um, middle woodwind sounds. And I think that's exciting that a composer can convey a score with no limitations at all. He just writes what he wants to write musically and it's our job 
and our responsibility and our challenge to recreate in performance what his um, musical intention was as a composer. So in many ways, the creative composer and the recreative, the ensemble, come together in a, a beautiful way, I think, through the God Particle. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how many brass bands we hear and how many orchestral brass combinations we hear, because I think it's an orchestral score conveyed for the brass orchestra, because the collars he's searching for are new um, and I think quite challenging technically, but provided that the technical challenges don't stand in the way of the architecture of the music itself, I think, um, I think this composer is going to be writing many times for brass band. But I think we've got to accept this as a gift from somebody outside who doesn't have limitations and doesn't think that we have limitations and there lie the challenge because of course we do have lim limitations but to try to rise to what the score is trying to do and not think well I can't do that or that's not what we normally would be expecting I think this piece is therefore one of the most exciting pieces we've done um, at the European Championships for many years. Mm. Would you say that the piece sort of challenges the mindset of a traditional brass bander? That's a good question. What is the mindset of the traditional brass bander? I don't think Eber is about traditional mind anymore. I think Eber and the people of Europe, the players that take part, the conductors, the level of education that everyone in the brass band movement that once upon a time traditionally didn't have the opportunity to have. Education is a, is a great thing. Um, it gives you an understanding of things that perhaps you wouldn't have even, well, in many, as many respects, it's like having a meal and somebody, you go to somewhere culturally and someone introduces you to something, Mexican food, not as Mexican food is served up in Australia, but Mexican food as it's served up in Mexico. It's the same thing. This score is Germanic um, origin, um, Germanic conception, um, and it's, again, offered as a meal. It's a musical meal. And I think if we um, look at it like that, I think, our repertoire is bound to succeed in terms of um, evolution. We have to evolve, we have to do things different. And I think without going into another area which your question didn't ask, I think one thing that would be an interesting question would be um, to, to delve in and look at how playing scores of such mammoth technical proportions with no limitations on the player's um, expectation from the composer, can we still go back and play? of distant memories. Um, the critics say no, but the critics don't know everything they only think they do. I think the important thing is that the musicians do know that they can still maintain the traditional concept of making wonderful music. The thing that's common, the common thread between contemporary music or new ideas or um, uh, looking at that with um, sort of a comparison with mainstream traditional music, I think the one thing that comes through is the architecture, finding the forest rather than every single tree. There's a lot of particles in there, but those particles make up the whole. And whatever that is actually conveying, whether that's the completeness or whether it's the black hole that it talks about that comes as a result of everything outside. It's like, what is light? What makes light? Darkness makes light. For without darkness, there is no light. Without light, there is no darkness. So the concept of the lighthouse looking down on the water, you can see it as an incredible, intense um, beam of um, navigation. Or it can be that you actually look outside of that and see that that actually defines more clearly the less obvious. And I think this score has a lot in the back part of it particularly, which is literally about the black hole that science is talking about, talking about, um, and also musically conceiving the concept of light and darkness. And I think that, is no different to light and darkness in labor and love. It's just the language that's used to convey these concepts of light and darkness are different. But thank goodness we're progressing forward in terms of our repertoire, the composers, and the challenges that keep it um, an interesting experience for players, for conductors, and hopefully for audiences as well. Um, um, talking about development, if we look back and look at the role of honour for the national championships in Norway, we see the name David King appearing uh, sort of in three bulks. 
one with Stavanga, one with Monga, and one with Aikonga. And as you said, you've been coming here since 1989. Mm. Uh, how has the Norwegian band movement moved, hopefully, forward? Can you say anything about that? Yes, oh, I think firstly we're talking about repertoire. Uh, repertoire is um, certainly more progressive and progressing at a faster pace than perhaps it was back in the 80s, 90s, if that's, I think that's a fair statement. And I think one of the reasons for that is literally the computer age. Composers are now able to convey um, music quickly using the Sibelius. Um, if you want to correct something that you might have spent two weeks writing, you can do it in two seconds. Um, that can be good, it can also be very uh, limiting as well, because the one thing that we find in a lot of compositions that don't quite um, cut it, so to speak, is the fact that the composers cut and paste. And I think cutting and pasting to try to get a 12 minute work just to use material up, which we often find in, in, um, in um, lesser credible composition, which is young aspiring um, up and coming uh, arrangers and, and composers. I think that's one of the downsides, but the upside is that music can be turned through quickly. Composers can hear the music through their headphones, can listen to the computer version, can work it out. And of course, in terms of technical challenge, they can move the bar line, which they think is a lot of fun. The composers seem to enjoy that, where they'll write something in 4-4 and end up conceiving it on paper in anything but simple time. And then the frustration, of course, is that the bands or the orchestras, the conductors, may spend months and months going through the score, putting it back to where it should have been in the first place so that it is actually easy. And the composers really have got to ask themselves seriously whether they're doing it for a musical um, purpose or whether it's actually for a menacing purpose, which is to make it look difficult. And I think the most difficult thing is trying to find what the inner life of the score is. I think um, when you look at um, um, Ludus Tonalis, wonderful collection of um, piano keyboard works by Hindemith, um, the preface note there talks about the inner life, finding the cantabile, if you like, finding the, the sweet spot of the music or, or the, the overall architectonic nature of the music and not seeing it broken down, oh, it's contemporary, there is no line. Oh, there's no melody, there is no line. Quite the opposite. Some of the most beautiful lines are non-melodic. And many of them is finding, again, that shape through the music so that it's not just a lot of trees, there's an there's a architecturally conceived forest. And I think the repertoire is getting harder, um, and I think the players are becoming obviously much more um, technically apt. But I disagree strongly with the idea that our musicians today are incapable of making beautiful music of a more um, traditional nature. It's just become a kind of a cliched get out clause by the press, whoever the press might be, to suggest that we can't still play the old music. No, we don't play the old music in the way it used to be played but we don't do anything in the way things used to be. It's looking at old wine and pouring it into new bottles. Fundamentally, that's the most significant thing. And some people um, would say that that's, for their ears, not the case. Normally, they're people who once played or once listened and are unable to actually hear what's being done in the manner that it's actually being um, portrayed or painted by musicians. I think we can do almost anything now with brass bands and I think brass bands in Norway particularly have come a long way. If I was to, I don't listen much to, to brass band music, um, but certainly my, my inner ear can still hear performances in the early 90s from, from conducting bands in Norway and I would say some of those performances that we once thought were fantastic, if you actually listen to them now in the context and compare it with where Norwegian bands are now, I think that they would struggle to get a first prize in today's context. That's not to say that they weren't outstanding for their time and for where they were in relation because competitions, whether it's in sport or music, even it's not a question of what right, whether it's right or wrong, we choose to do it, therefore it's right for us. But if you're competing with emotion, then fundamentally it doesn't matter what's being actually put down on the paper. You're dealing with what you prefer or what I prefer or what somebody else prefers. Therefore, we have to accept we'll never actually be able to paint the picture that will satisfy everybody. The only way to get something that satisfies everybody that it's a first prize is if nobody else comes up with anything that seems to have any um, substance. But if somebody else is saying something, we have to accept that that may be for somebody else exactly what they would want to hear.
If we accept that, well, then we'll keep coming back and enjoy the progression of brass bands and enjoy sharing it as well because Ikanga didn't win the competition this year. You know, it's probably one of the best things that's happened to Norwegian banding. I think it's very positive, um, extremely positive. I'd love to see one of these Oslo-based brass bands or one of these bands in the more remote areas. It would be great to see them suddenly just come and snatch it. I think Sandefjord um, snatched it one year from nowhere um, with um, Gareth Pritchard, I think, was conducting. And that just came from nowhere. And it did the job, won the competition and deserved it. And I'd like to see more of that. I think it would be very healthy. I think sharing it gives that sense of um, collegiate um, movement, progressive movement, so that when a band like Ikanga goes to the European, they can feel that all those other bands are actually saying, it's your turn, we're behind you, we'd really like to see it come home. And I'd like to see it come home to Norway. I'd certainly like to see um, the Norwegian tradition, the work of it, of the Norwegian Federation, the work of these experienced conductors and musicians. They are the most professional organisation as a movement anywhere in Europe, therefore anywhere in the world of brass bands. And I think that it's, it's time for Norway to claim their, um, their rightful place, which is um, right at the top of brass banding. So, um, Ikanga could be a bit of a dark horse in the Europeans then. Uh, as you say, uh, Sonnefjord, for instance, was one year in, in the nationals in, your, in, in Norway. And we saw a bit of a dark horse last year in in the Europeans where it wasn't one of the traditional uh, winners who, who became European champions but somebody else came up and, and, and took it and you actually uh, appreciate this. Do I appreciate this? Um, no, I didn't appreciate losing no. last no, year. No, no, of course not. No, of course <laughs> no, not. no um, but I appreciate the fact that um, a young conductor um, who I, I know personally as well as professionally was able to take his ensemble and lift them to the place where they fulfilled what two sets of adjudicators wanted and he gained first prize. I think that's very healthy, extremely healthy. That I can appreciate. Um, I think you started the question by saying, perhaps Ikanga is a dark horse. There's nothing dark horse about Ikanga. Ikanga are a champion and Ikanga um, have proved that time and time again. And they'll continue to, irrespective of whether they get another second. The fact of the matter, they may get a third and play better than they ever have. That's the point. That's contesting. I think um, people only remember the first prizes. I think Monga Music Club, the, the first um, elite band, elite section band, that um, I had the privilege of, of um, having a first prize with here in, in Norway in the national championships. People outside of the very close circle of Monga people who are now mm. old like me, and probably play in all-star bands, in Monga all-stars, and these people, they'll remember that the four years prior to winning four in a row was four seconds. Mm. So you can have four seconds, so you can always see second as not winning. Or oh, it was really close? No, it was nowhere. It didn't get the prize. End of story. But it takes sometimes um, that challenge of just keeping driving, keeping believing, and keep actually moving in the direction of what you believe and, um, and have um, the conviction that what you're doing is right and eventually it'll come good. But it doesn't come that way without a lot of effort and I think um, the seconds only make the band stronger and more experienced and more mature. It doesn't make them a dark horse. Quite the opposite, it makes them champions. And uh, those that know, know. And um, I mean musically speaking, those that know claim the fact that Ikanga is one of the greatest brass combinations of any genre of brass anywhere in the world, as are a number of other great bands also um, in Europe. So I think that um, it's important for us to see that, that they have endless possibilities to actually bring something home. If they don't, it won't be for lack of trying because they've put so much work in. And uh, all credit to their conductor, Ray Gilliard, mm -hmm. and to every single player who's worked so hard. We hope it's a good one for Norway. Mm. Yeah, I will be there okay. and I will be watching and listening and I hope it goes the way we want mm. to.
Hvis du har lyst til å se og høre Eikanger Bjørsvik live før de reiser til EM, så har du muligheten mandag 27. april kl. 19. Da har de en før-EM-konsert.